Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Chris Wolforth. I'm the acting director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I am, um, on behalf of our co-sponsors for this event, the Hood Museum of Art, the Hopkins Center for the Performing Arts, and the Leslie Center for the Humanities, I want to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation on the liberal arts vision in a global age, romance or realism. This month marks the 30th anniversary of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. Um, and throughout the year, we've been celebrating some of the enduring legacies of Dartmouth's 12th president, John Sloan Dickey, um, in whose honor our center was, was founded. Today, we celebrate particularly Dickey's commitment to the liberal arts, which he termed the liberating arts. His invocation of this phrase signaled his belief that education required a significant degree of personal responsibility. The liberal arts become the liberating arts because they are the product of struggle, of comparison, and ultimately of choice, choice between conflicting values, hypotheses, and worldviews. It is in the conscious exercise of choice that learning manifests itself in action. The aim of all true education, he declared in his convocation speech of 1957, is to give man a creative relation to life. It is creativity alone that enlarges understanding, multiplies the wealth of nations, uh, improves the weapons of war, fashions the ways of peace, and endows man with his civilizing hallmarks, a love of beauty and a will to truth. Opportunities for creativity are potentially unlimited in every life, and it has been the historical function of education in the liberating arts to free men, one by one, for the fullest possible enjoyment of these opportunities. It is particularly apt that we take this time now to take stock of what a liberal arts education can promise in a global age, particularly as Dartmouth is undergoing a strategic planning process for the next phase of its existence, but also for Dartmouth students who are grappling with how best to leverage their education for the world that they will inherit. I have asked my colleague, Associate Dean of the Humanities, uh, of the, Associate Dean of the Faculty for the Humanities, and the Leon E. Williams Professor of Art History to introduce our speaker this afternoon. So, Adrian, would you please do the honors? Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm Adrian Randolph, and I'm an art historian by trade, and that makes me a kindred spirit with our guest speaker today, who's uh, trained as an art historian. And when Chris uh, and I started speaking about the liberal and liberating arts, uh, Mariette Vesterman's name came very much and very quickly uh, to my mind as one of the individuals who can speak uh, about that from a variety of perspectives, uh, precisely because of her varied uh, career uh, as seeing the liberal and liberating arts from a variety of uh, perspectives. Her academic experience ensures that she understands this in a very differentiated way. She's been a faculty member at a university with a committed liberal arts curriculum. She's worked at research institutes and directed distinguished graduate or autonomous graduate programs. She's worked to establish NYU's satellite campus in Abu Dhabi, which promotes a liberal arts curriculum. And now as vice president of the Mellon Foundation, Professor Vesterman engages with education at another level, seeking to sustain and promote excellence within higher education and the arts. So having been a professor of art history at Rutgers University and associate director of research and academic programming at the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Vesterman became director of the Institute of Fine Arts, NYU, and then vice provost of NYU Abu Dhabi. And in June 2010, she joined the Mellon Foundation, a very condensed version of a really extraordinary CV, if you can see the trajectory. Her administrative work and the excellence of it is visible in the excellence and ambition of the project she's developed, at the institution she's stewarded. With her help, the Clark Art Institute's research program really developed into a fascinating disciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, place within the world of art history and beyond. Uh, if you think about the intellectual environment of the Institute of Fine Arts and how she, under her directorship, that grew and became differentiated and really a, a major, uh, well, it has always been, but it still is maintained its position as a, a major beacon of art historical scholarship in the USA. And pursuing uh, uh, that as an administrator at NYU, starting this really, I think, I, I think it's clear she was in at the very ground level of the beginning of the project with Abu Dhabi, which is, I assume, going to figure somewhere in the talk today, uh, as one of the most, I think, serious efforts to establish 
uh, a very strong liberal arts uh, curriculum in uh, a different part of the world. Now, it may seem odd to think of this uh, stemming from someone whose interests turn to early modern European culture, but when one realizes that Professor Vesterman's interests stem from the Dutch uh, 17th century context, perhaps it makes sense given its internationalism. Uh, in a series of books and catalogues, Vesterman has addressed the Dutch interior, the comic work, uh, the comic work of Jan Steen, uh, the intellectual contribution of, of Rembrandt's art, and in what is perhaps her best known contribution, offered a synthetic treatment of Dutch art of the 17th century. Few scholars have managed to contribute so richly to their study, uh, to the study of their field. And today, instead of the worldly art of the Dutch golden age, we shall turn to education in the worldly globalism of our age. As we all know, there are enormous challenges to face in the coming years while education not only demands that our students negotiate a global environment, but also that education responds to its waxing internationalism. And Dartmouth, as an institution that has long set a premium on sending many of our students abroad, cannot remain complacent. And for many of us who spent many terms teaching abroad, it's important to consider how this might contribute not only to the development of three free thinking at the heart of the artes liberales, but also how foreign study advances the new types of international understanding at the heart of the mission of the Dickey Center, whose 30th anniversary we're celebrating today. I'd like to thank Chris Wolforth, uh, Wolforth, now I'm confusing my Ws, uh, Wolforth, Interim Director of the Dickey Center, not only for this collaborative enterprise, but also for all of the small and large ways in which she helped me during my tenure as the Leslie Center Director, uh, which is now under the directorship of my colleague, uh, Professor Colleen Boggs. And I'll echo the thanks to our co-sponsors in this, uh, the Leslie Center, the Hopkins Center for the Arts, and the Hood Museum of Art, all of which treasure the values at the heart of the Mellon Foundation and at the heart of the educational approach about which we'll be hearing more today. So in the spirit of giving oneself over to the possibilities of a liberal, free, and non-mechanical type of thinking, I suggest that we now liberally bestow our attention and thanks to our speaker, Mariette Vesterman. Thank you very much, Adrian, for that uh, extremely elegant and generous summation of my career, which makes a whole lot more sense of it than I can myself, but that is in the nature of the liberal arts. The liberal arts do liberate and encourage you to think widely and broadly and to try things that you never thought would come on your path. It's one of their great qualities. I want to thank also Chris very much for organizing this lecture here and inviting me to the Dickey Center and for reminding us that the liberal arts are the liberating arts. I certainly have um, repeatedly in my life felt liberated by them, as you will hear. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, thank you. In the 1980s, the Carnegie classification of institutions of higher education identified some 600 institutions in the United States as liberal arts colleges. When an economist was doing a study of liberal arts colleges and reviewed that list of 600 in 1990, he concluded that only 212 could really be considered to be liberal arts colleges, the other institutions providing primarily vocational or professional education. Three years ago, two scholars of higher education revisited his list and discovered that that list of 212 should really be reduced to 137. Some colleges had closed, but more had retooled themselves significantly in a vocational direction. By many analogous measures, liberal arts education in the US no longer attracts the numbers of students in an absolute sense or as a proportion of all undergraduate enrollments in the US that it did around 1970. The numbers I just gave you represent an attrition of, of more than a third, uh, two thirds after all. Around 1970 was the last period of peak enrollments in liberal arts programs. Things have gone downhill numerically since then. The question for liberal arts colleges today then is whether they can be relevant in an age of relentless pressure on disinterested education driven by curiosity. 
and an age of insistent and frankly understandable calls from parents and politicians for education that will reset America on a path to greater employment, competitiveness, and prosperity for all. The question is not whether Dartmouth and other top-tier colleges such as Amherst and Pomona will survive. They will. The question is whether they will find themselves leaders of a shrinking sector that in the end will be a boutique element in a burgeoning <coughs> educational system that essentially devalues, perhaps even ridicules, perhaps even pities, what it offers. This question is urgent because liberal arts education requires such intensive deployment of intellectual and highly skilled labor per student that it is quite simply the most expensive model of higher education ever invented. If its social utility is therefore seen to de decrease, support for it will surely erode further. And that could leave places like Amherst and Williams and, and Dartmouth very lonely at the top. The accelerated mobility of people, goods, services and ideas worldwide of the last two decades offers both hope and new challenges. International exchange and connectivity are highly compatible with the intercultural ethos and goals of liberal education. But the internationalist attitude that now defines many liberal arts institutions may come up against new imperatives of what is now called the new state capitalism. The worldwide recession of 2008 has made the major economic players, including the United States itself, warier of investments or policies that might be perceived domestically to put other countries first. In higher education, as in any other fields the world over, sharpened focus on domestic economies is dampening some of the promise of globalization, even if it may be impossible to put that genie of the last few decades back in its bottle. I certainly hope it is. Uh, impossible. Whether liberal arts education in our globalized but economically challenged moment will be a romantic backwater or a realist option in the international competition for students, relevance and impact is for me a question of evident pro professional interest. The Mellon Foundation has supported liberal arts colleges for all of its existence and one of its first and finest presidents, Jack Sawyer, had been a transformative leader at Williams College, my alma mater. How best to understand the role of the liberal arts in the matrix that is higher education in America today, if not the world, and how best to support that role of the liberal arts in a sustainable way are everyday concerns for us at the foundation. Dartmouth is a great partner for us in that regard. So liberal arts colleges operate in a difficult environment today. All of higher education in the last two decades has had to respond to transformative social and economic developments. New environmental factors such as ubiquitous web connectivity, huge demographic shifts, global stu stu student mobility, and growing economic inequality pose serious questions or even threats to the sustainability of an educational model that is of 18th century origin, and one that prides itself on maintaining, say, a one to eight faculty student ratios and small seminars. It prides itself on catering to the curiosity and dining preferences of every single student, mm -hmm. and providing need blind admission and need based, need based aid that are critical to its diversity and equity. How can a model that is born of the distinction between broad preparation for civic life and, and, on the one hand, and professional training on the other, how can such a model respond to current demands that higher education serve workforce development? Can an institutional type whose character was so fundamentally shaped by white elites over a long time, can that ever be as welcoming, inclusive, and representative of the American population at large as more capacious universities have proven themselves to be? And given its historical origins in the early American Republic, can the model transfer to the different economic, political, and demographic contexts of other countries that are now so significant on the world scene? 
this is a very challenging complex of questions that needs to be addressed in many different ways, and I, I can barely scratch the surface today. But beginning to try to answer them requires all of us who care about these institutions and the education they provide to have a theory of the value they offer. In this talk, I will try to probe the relevance of liberal arts vision today by reviewing the romance of it, first of all, then checking in on its current realities, and finally considering the new opportunities that globalization may yet afford. So part one, romance. Always start with the best part first. The future of the Liberal Arts College is a deeply personal concern for me. As a high school student in the Netherlands in the 1970s, I felt constrained by the university options that were open to me. Intellectually curious but uncertain of my interests and capacities, I was attracted to the exploratory yet rigorous character of a liberal arts education, and I was keenly aware that such a model was completely unavailable in Europe at the time. And so I came to this country for the explicit purpose of studying at such a place, Williams College. Unlike most American applicants to liberal arts colleges, I was unburdened by parental or legacy considerations, and so the choice of Williams was completely accidental. I did not pick the place, I chose the sector. It was the best college I got into, according to the dog-eared copy of a Barron's Guide that an American friend of my father's had lent me, and the place sounded smart and beautiful. Had I known to check the map, of course, I would not have been so surprised to arrive in a town without shops or restaurants to speak of, but it took only days for me to fall in love with my choice. Initially, I tried to convert an avid interest I had long had in amateur astronomy into a major in astrophysics, which I mostly found very, very beautiful, and still do. I couldn't do the higher order math, however, and so I ended up an art historian. <laughs> liberating, but only after I had majored in history and written a thesis in my senior year on European unification. I came to art history very, very late. Without my tangential exposure to art history in college, which was propelled by my peers rather than by any formal advising, I would never have considered such a frivolous subject. And without the efforts of a professor of Netherlandish art to engage me directly in her research, I would never have understood that being a scholar was something you could do for a living. If I had stayed in the Netherlands, I would have become a lawyer. I think I would have become a fine lawyer. It would have been perfectly all right, but art history has been the writer choice for me. The liberal arts are, of course, not all about having choices or realizing one's latent potential. Those semesters struggling through calculus or thinking about European politics showed me that disparate fields of knowledge yet require similar disciplines of critical thought and analogous protocols of research. And with hindsight, but this came later, I realized that even those disciplinary structures don't yield compelling new knowledge without the broad curiosity and frankly quirky sparks that propel insight when you're with really smart people, or without the dialogic and conflictual interactions that can yield shared, nuanced, and indeed oppositional understanding. Wide and deep reading, close looking and listening, clear thinking, transient analysis, creative problem solving, articulate communication, and a judicious capacity for compromise are vital skills for our complex world, no matter what field or career you pursue. I was not aware of all of these shibboleths about the liberal arts when I was going through the process. And even now, when I think back of my college experience, what memory yields up most vividly is that experience of campus living. I was completely unprepared for the American college campus, familiar as I was with the Dutch University's insouciant neglect of students competing for stamp-sized rooms on a tight real estate market, not to mention the Dutch University's disinterest in the propensity of its students to self-medicate. They just didn't care. They let you simmer, sink or swim. And people were very happy with that. At Williams, I found a campus blend of isolation, paternalism, camaraderie, competition, entrepreneurship, 
and representational governance both exotic but also, and, and, and engrossing. The American campus fosters community by unfettered proliferation of the wildest associational life. Debating societies, literary clubs, athletic teams, governance committees, student newspapers and radio stations, film societies, and social clubs catering to every arcane interest under the sun. All of these organizational forms allow students to try on for size, roles that require and mobilize capabilities beyond sheer academic prowess, which everyone there has. Civic values and leadership are modeled and practiced on the college campus, and lasting bonds of interest are forged there. Living, studying, and playing in close quarters with people who are, for the most part, just as surprisingly smart as you, but very different in many other ways, can be hard work. It produces conflict. It takes patience, tolerance, and a willingness to see the world and yourself from another place. These are principles of the liberal arts classroom, of course, as well. But class meets for only two and a half hours each week. You can get away from it. Practicing these virtues 24-7 and sometimes failing at them in the dorm, the dining halls, and the social spaces in between is not for the faint-hearted. Yet the friendships born in such a community are the stronger for the effort. And many of them, we all know this, last. Okay, you are all from this community, so you may wonder why I've been preaching to the choir. I hope that my personal experience has let emerge a topology, a, a, a constellation of features of liberal arts colleges without forcing me to rehearse them in the usual admissions office speak. We do small seminars, you get personal attention, you live in a cool community and so on. I think it is precisely the commonness, the typicality of my experience that clarifies the cohesion, longevity, and appeal of the liberal arts college today, or of, of, of the liberal arts college idea. It's been an incredibly sustained idea, after all. In terms of what I valued about my college education, my experience probably sounds a lot like that of most anyone who has attended a liberal arts college in the last 200 years. Even if my particular trajectory postdates the massive growth of rather differently organized colleges of religious foundation in the 19th century, and even if my experience obviously predates the sector's considerable innovations of the last two decades, which have included broadening of access through need-blind admission and need-based aid, concomitant and very healthy student and faculty diversification, a decanonizing and interdisciplining of the curriculum, a pervasive technologizing of the campus, rapid expansion of study abroad, and the arrival of any number of amenities from liberalized meal plans to statutory climbing walls. <laughs> My conversations with students at these colleges suggest that those potentially transform the forces of the last quarter century have not yet changed the student experience of liberal arts colleges in fundamental ways. Students talk about their college lives in ways that are comfort comfortingly familiar and encouraging to me. We seem to share a rosy consensus about the value of disinterested academic study, um, and, and, and of, of deferred professional specialization conducted in a diverse and intimate residential community. The idealism or romanticism of this view of liberal arts education may not equip us fully for an activist defense of this form of education today. But that romanticism is fundamental to the liberal arts college as institutional form. It's in the DNA. In his marvelous study, The Distinctive College, published in 1970, Burton Clark called the Liberal Arts College the romantic element in our educational system. The romantic element in our educational system. What did he mean? Clark's book chronicles the stop and start transformations of three liberal arts colleges, Antioch, Reed, and Swarthmore, into leading institutions with a strong and particular sense of identity and mission. They achieved their eventual success because of the visionary leadership of key presidents 
and maintained it, at least for a long time, because the vision of those leaders was encoded into something Clark called the institutional saga. The saga, as the word implies, is a creation myth of sorts that arises around or by force of a leading figure in the college's history and serves as a continuous fount of renewal. Anyone who has spent significant time in a liberal arts college knows of what Clark speaks. The sagas may have a nugget of fact at their hearts, but they are ultimately more important for the larger truth they tell about the college's understanding of its role in the present. The strength of a college depends to some degree on the relevance of its origin myths for its culture and problems today. Every Williams student, for example, knows the story about Mark Hopkins and the log. Hopkins, a professor of moral philosophy who served as president from 1836 to 1872, is legendary for having posited as the ideal educational model an image of a teacher and a solitary student sitting and talking on opposite sides of a log. Never mind that this collective institutional Williams memory is twice garbled. The statement was not his, but President Garfield's, the American president. Or rather, Garfield is rumored, and only rumored, to have said it of Hopkins himself. Never mind. During the recent brilliant presidency of Morty Shapiro, the story became a touchstone for the introduction of Oxford-style tutorials that propelled a whole wave of new faculty hiring. One could debate whether one-on-one -on -one teaching on a log is still the best instructional form in the age of teamwork, but there is no question that the romance of the log continues to have cohesive and productive force at Williams when that is needed. Each college has a rich raft of romance stories. I particular, particularly love one of yours. That seems especially relevant today, perhaps more relevant than the log. You will know it well. In 1816, the Dartmouth trustees faced a formidable challenge when the newly elected governor of New Hampshire took advantage of internal feuding at the college to seek greater state control over the institution. The governor claimed that the charter that the legislature of New Hampshire had granted to Dartmouth was not a contract of private incorporation and that the college's assets and policies should therefore not be beyond state control or public control. The trustees fought it, but they lost the case in the Superior Court of New Hampshire in 1817. In the Young Republic, however, the importance of adjudicating the distinction between public and private institutions was so considerable and fraught that the following year, the, Su the US Supreme Court took up the case. There, and this is the romance story, Daniel Webster, class of 1801, argued for the trustees. In his remarkable history of the American College and University, Frederick Rudolph recounted the story's climax as follows, and I quote him. As he drew to a close, legend has it that Daniel Webster broke into tears. The Chief Justice, Mr. Marshall, bending over to catch every word, was himself in tears as Daniel Webster closed his play. This, sir, is my case. It is the case not merely of that humble institution, it is the case of every college in the land. It is more. It is the case of every eleemosynary institution throughout our country. For the question is simply this. Shall our state legislator be allowed to take that which is not their own, to turn it from its original use and apply it to such ends or purposes as they in their discretion shall see fit? Sir, you may destroy this little institution, but if you do, you must extinguish one after another all those great lights of science which for more than a century have thrown their radiance over the land. It is, sir, as I have said, a small college, and yet there are those that love it. The Supreme Court sided with the trustees of the college, confirming that as a private charitable institution, offering benefits to the public, Dartmouth was not a public entity under state control. The decision became a landmark in the history of judicial protection of private institutions and their property. And so on behalf of the Mellon Foundation, which is a private eleemosynary institution too, <laughs> I thank Dartmouth College.
and Daniel Webster. For the liberal arts college sector, the decision launched a period of unprecedented consolidation and entrepreneurial expansion, which saw many new colleges established out of primarily Christian denominations over the next 50 years. In the age of Jackson, the Supreme Court surely did not make its decision entirely on the strength of Webster's tearful love of Dartmouth. What seems remarkable about his closing argument, however, is the emotional appeal to the niche character of the institution and its importance for those that love it. The implication was that America's courts and legislatures should not impede small private institutions in their work for the public good. That they were in a sense too small to be worth messing with, but that together they could accomplish great things for the nation. Today, when public discourse challenges the excessive costs, privilege and other, world, other worldliness of private colleges at every turn, we, do to, we would do well to keep in view the romance of liberal arts vision, even as we need to argue the case for it on perhaps mercenary grounds. Part two, reality checks. The heroic history of liberal arts colleges in the time of Webster and Hopkins sustained them when their survival was threatened by the rise of research universities on the European model from the late 19th century forward. The Liberal Arts College successfully distinguished its broad preparation for participatory citizenship and a meaningful life from the university's orientation to specialized graduate training and research. Nevertheless, for more than a century now, despite a few momentary upticks, liberal arts colleges have been losing ground against research universities, both in numbers of institutions as well as and in percentages of bachelor's degrees granted. For at least a decade now, a drum roll of studies, op-eds, and books has been sounding the demise or descent into irrelevance of the liberal arts college model or of liberal education or of the core arts and sciences in universities. Crisis on campus, academically adrift, the problem of general education, the arts and sciences in decline, starting to worry, the case of the disappearing liberal arts college. There's just a smattering of titles. These books and articles, mostly written by people who love liberal education, but would, would like to see it stand up for itself and sustain itself by innovation and enhanced productivity, identify a wide range of problems. Whilst, and some are incompatible with each other. While some bemoan the loss of traditional liberal arts, emphases and breadth, others decry the inability of faculty to renovate old curricula to teach skills that are relevant to students today, skills other than deep reading and careful writing. The role calls of challenges that these writers issue include decreasing interest in humanities fields that are central to liberal education, the inability of faculty to develop consensus of what a core liberal arts curriculum should look like, or even whether there should be one at all, or even what liberal education is or is for. The drive of liberal arts college faculty to be more like their research university peers with concomitant demand for less teaching, more leave, and narrower majors that can start to feel an awful lot like little graduate programs. Expenditures driven by expensive non-academic luxuries like sports facilities and multiple dining venues rather than academic essentials. This is just that roll call of complaints that you hear over and over again. And they all have a, a base in some truth, I think. But it is perhaps reassuring that we have seen this movie before. Fred Rudolph's History of American Higher Education charts the hydraulic pool over time between calls for professional preparation and expertise on the one hand, and the defense of a broader and more reflective approach to the large approach on the other, and the many states of precarious balance in between over time. More than 40 years ago, the brilliant historian James Axtell wrote a clever defense of the liberal arts college against the belief that its death knell had been tolling since Jacksonian calls for expert professional education in the 1820s. And that liberal arts education had presumably been killed off once and for all by the Land Grant Act of 1862 that created the framework for large state universities. 
Axel argued instead that the liberal arts college had continued to offer viable models and that it had actually shaped the character of undergraduate education in research universities, which after all plays at their hearts colleges of arts and sciences that have an emphasis on breadth, small classes, and residential living. Nevertheless, even though I agree more or less with Axel on this, nevertheless, today's alarm bells are not sounding business as usual. Since the 1950s, the liberal arts college sector has seen relentless retrenchment and pre-professionalization of its curricula. In 1950, liberal arts, I'll give you some numbers. In 1950, liberal arts colleges accounted for 40% of higher education institutions in the US. 40% of all institutions of higher education were liberal arts colleges like Dartmouth and below. By 1970, as universities and community colleges had expanded massively, that percentage was 25% of all institutions. In enrollment terms, the percentages dropped from 25% of all undergraduate enrollments in the mid-1950s to 8% by the early 1970s. Today, liberal arts colleges carry 2 to 3% of the total undergraduate enrollments in the US. The largest undergraduate major across all institutions, liberal arts colleges, higher ed, uh, research universities, uh, community colleges, and so, so forth, the largest undergraduate major is business, accounting for 22%. Doesn't seem to have helped the nation any, but uh, never mind. <laughs> Accounted for 22%. Followed by education at 10%, and teaching of teachers, and health professions at 7 These are undergraduate degrees. For English, it is 4%, and for history, 2%. Of all bachelor's degrees awarded in the US today, at most 10% total of all fields combined is in humanities fields that correlate strongly with liberal arts degrees. I won't be able to address today the many factors that help account for these declining demand trends for liberal arts study. It is worth pointing out, however, that this is not all bad news, because not the least of the conditions that account for it is the dramatic and welcome increase of educational institutions and student numbers since World War II. First-generation families entering an educational system where new players provide alternatives to liberal arts colleges that have had high barriers to entry, these new first-generation families entering the system cannot be expected immediately to share the values of an academically elite type of education that also, unfortunately, has a socially elitist history. Even if it is undeniably true that liberal arts education correlates positively with professional and financial success, the case can be hard to make when the actual expense and opportunity costs of spending four years in a non-professional program prior to uh, specialization loom very large if you've never even thought about going to college to begin with. If you pair the downward demand for liberal arts degrees with the high cost per student of liberal education, Pair those two factors, is downward demand, high cost per student, and then you factor in that institutions face limitations on how fast they can continue to grow tuition. And you factor in the unsustainable tuition discounts that colleges need to apply to ensure broad access. And you add a constrained fundraising landscape that we are all seeing. Plus, you add national demand for the renewal of professional education starting in the White House, it seems all but certain that the sector will shrink further, certainly in proportion to other types of education and perhaps in absolute numbers. Okay, those were some reality checks. Now, lest the romance of liberal arts vision is by now starting to sound like that of Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet on the bow of the Titanic, <laughs> uh, I think we should turn to better news which is a reality check as well. Leading liberal arts colleges have begun to articulate responses to their long-term predicament, this structural situation I've tried to outline. They are taking on advocacy and seeking solutions towards greater cost efficiency. That work may be somewhat marginal because it is a high cost model, but the effort itself 
I would say, is significant in the public sphere. Colleges such as Smith, Middlebury, and the University of the South have recognized publicly that for now they have come up against the limits of tuition increase rates. Tuition will continue to increase, but not at those 5% rates that we got used to in, when the going was good in the 90s and the 90s and the noughts. Smith College has conducted a comprehensive exercise to study savings that might be introduced. And Middlebury has, sought, has thought of ways to complement its resources with online language instruction, which it's well set up to offer. College presidents are joining their university colleagues in public argument for the value of breadth, small classes, undergraduate research, and interdisciplinarity as goods in their own right and as vital ingredients in the preparation of leaders who will be expected to work across the borders of disciplines, institutional types, and countries. Robust collaboration and exchange among disciplines are distinctive features of the liberal arts college and more easily achieved there than in uh, specialized professional education and research universities. The most successful employees of the future in any sector can expect to change jobs and locations more frequently than their parents and grandparents could ever have conceived of. Liberal education prepares students for the required adaptability. At Mellon, while encouraging presidents to take this stance, of course, we have also begun to focus more of our liberal arts college funding on creative and cost-efficient collaborations among colleges and between colleges and research universities. For example, two colleges sitting next to each other in Philadelphia may not both need a fully staffed um, art history department, for example. Perhaps they can share. Miracles in this domain cannot be worked overnight, but awareness of the need for action is now high. Sustained effort toward adjusted goals can produce results that are ultimately beneficial to the liberal arts college's understanding and renewal of its mission. Colleges have revitalized themselves before, in their antebellum history and in the mid-20th century, once the land-grant and private research universities were well established. I think they can do it again. Part three. Global renewal or innocence abroad? But there is more surprising news that's potentially good, although it's not unambiguous. It is a great paradox of this globalizing moment that just when America appears to be losing confidence in liberal education as an educational model, this quintessentially American idea is gaining traction abroad and in some unexpected places. This development follows the equally encouraging internationalization of liberal arts colleges in the US, even if that campus phenomenon has never been as pronounced as the far-reaching globalization of American research universities in the past 30 years. Is globalization at home and abroad the answer to a viable future for the liberal arts? To discern elements of an answer, it is important to distinguish first between the effects of globalization on liberal arts colleges at home and the establishment of liberal arts campuses abroad even though these phenomena can be related in mutually beneficial ways, especially within uh, single institutions sometimes. Liberal arts campuses at home first. Liberal arts campuses can enhance their global character and presence in three primary ways. First, they can recruit students from other countries. Second, they can make their curriculum more globally oriented, representative of diverse cultures, and comparative in reach. Third, they can enhance student access to study abroad. Over the past two decades, all colleges, with no prominent exception I can think of, have pursued these strategies actively. The proportion of international students at liberal arts colleges has increased significantly, though this was not hard because most colleges started from a low baseline in the 1980s of around 3% international students. Some colleges, like Mount Holyoke, have gone after this cohort aggressively and receive as much as 20% of their students from other countries now. Percentages at most liberal arts colleges remain in single digits, 
but top tier schools as well as more modestly ranked peers have all taken advantage of increased global mobility, particularly of students from China, India and Eastern Europe to achieve international student cohorts of 5 to 10 percent, say. This internationalizing strategy is driven by conflictual goals. Some schools seek diversity of all sorts and use financial aid aggressively to achieve it. Others view foreign students as primarily a good source of income and restrict the amount of aid they will grant to students from abroad, if they grant any at all. Few colleges take the enlightened views of the governments of countries like Singapore or the United Arab Emirates, which provide fellowships to attract foreign students in hopes of retaining them for their country once they study there. Since the 1970s, rich study abroad opportunities have become a standard expectation of all colleges that consider themselves top flight. From an initial focus on Europe, options have multiplied to all continents, although the majority of study abroad students from the US still favor European destinations or new options in English-speaking countries such as Australia and South Africa. A continuing challenge is the limited integration I think this is a very common problem for colleges. A continuing challenge is the limited integration of study abroad experience into the student's curricular trajectory over time. Select colleges such as Pitzer tackle this problem by creating customized experiences for students that are tied to longitudinal research projects that they conduct on their home campus in preparation or after the study abroad stint. I think it's a compelling model, although again very expensive to arrange. But perhaps the least organized, and I would say the least successful, of globalizing moves that colleges have made has been the incorporation of comparative and global perspectives directly into the curriculum. Schools that have a general education requirement come up against a challenge of agreeing, agreeing among departments what it means to decenter a core curriculum out of the Western tradition to take account of more parts of the world. Often a highly generalized, other than the West, requirement substitutes for an articulated vision of what it means to gain access to the foundational ideas, social structures, texts or monuments of another culture, let alone engage in meaningful dialogue with it. Even if such agreement is reached, faculty expertise often lags behind the aspirations of a newly global curriculum. You simply can't hire a whole new faculty quickly enough to deliver a truly uh, diverse and dispersed curriculum. But this picture of a globalizing liberal arts sector, sector is too negative. US colleges may not have a global liberal arts vision that is broadly shared, but they certainly have a global liberal arts practice. With its modular credit systems and highly elective curricula, the system is virtually designed for study abroad except perhaps for pre-med or engineering students who need to keep up with their requirements. With its historical emphasis on learning, debating and valuing the perspectives of others, liberal arts education is set, up to, is set up to welcome international students and to incorporate global dimensions into its curricula. The culture wars of the 1980s and the decanonization of curricula that ensued, particularly in the humanities, have fundamentally opened up the themes and geocultural zones of liberal arts study. The discourse has truly diversified and it is advancing. So much for the globalization of colleges at home. More startling than the internationalization of liberal arts colleges is the new establishment of liberal arts colleges abroad. That phenomenon is not new, and it follows, but it has accelerated. Historically, the phenomenon has followed three basic models. The oldest model is that of independent American universities and colleges abroad, incorporated in the United States, but invited to operate abroad by local governments and managed in their host cities. These institutions have highly international faculty and student bodies. They have American accreditation but that's sometimes the only American thing about them. They have strong local flavor and sometimes face local government constraints. 
the American universities of Beirut and Cairo and Robert College in Istanbul, all established by American missionaries in the 19th century, are the most venerable and successful of these institutions over time. They offer liberal arts curricula that are adjusted to look recognizable and prestigious to the regional students they seek, including professionally tinted tracks or undergraduate engineering, one of the most prestigious fields you can go into in that part of the world. But they feel American to a great degree. A second wave of campuses in the 20th century continued this approach of the Middle Eastern liberal arts universities, including Lebanese American University the Ameri and the American University of Paris, as well as the more recent American universities of Bulgaria, Sharjah, and Kuwait, the latter established with startup expertise from Dartmouth, very significantly. So that's one model. It's sort of the independent American entity in, uh, uh, operating abroad. Under another, a less common but growing model, American universities launch branch campuses that will grant their own degrees abroad. A pioneer of this approach was Temple University, which has for 30 years run a campus in Tokyo where students from many countries besides Japan can earn undergraduate degrees in a limited range of fields, including what they call general studies. New York, universities, New York University, as you already heard, has opened a broader honors college in Abu Dhabi that will eventually grow to 2,500 students and is truly going as a liberal arts enterprise. It offers a globally oriented liberal arts degree custom designed for the institution with a significant core curriculum and majors in many fields, as well as vigorous study abroad that is built into the program. NYU is now developing a similar campus in Shanghai, intended to have a population that will be 50% Chinese and 50% from other countries, primarily America. And in a version of this model, Yale is lending expertise to the establishment of a liberal arts college at the National University of Singapore, although Yale will leave the degree conferral to NUS. They will not uh, confer the Yale degree uh, more than two miles outside of New Haven. Um, this laundry list of American liberal arts institutions, and I'm sorry for it, but I wanted to give you a sense of texture. This laundry list of American liberal arts institutions abroad prompts two points. First, American liberal arts colleges abroad are typically established not by liberal arts colleges, but by independent entities or especially by research universities that have a size and a depth of faculty and administration that can provide instant startup leadership in numbers. In their overseas enterprises, universities like Yale and NYU thus exemplify that flow of liberal arts practice back into the research university that is a sustaining factor of liberal education and that in a way proves its resilience. It's interesting that these research universities, what do they do abroad? They establish a liberal arts campus, not a research university first. Second, the particular locations of the campuses I have mentioned track closely with the history of American interests in the regions where they were established and also with the economic fortunes or potentials of the host countries. Even if these American campuses are private initiatives rather than extensions of foreign policy, and most universities are very careful to maintain that separation, it is no coincidence that they first flourished in the Middle East at a time when American churches became interested in missionary activity and that these Middle Eastern campuses were sustained and extended as American interests in the region grew after World War II for all the reasons we know. Japan in the 1970s was an obvious destination for Temple, but its long economic stagnation after the 1980s makes it a much less evident choice today. The establishment of the American University of Bulgaria in 1992 or the Bard Smolny College in St. Petersburg in 1997 reflected the heady economic and intercultural op optimism of the immediate post-communist moment. NYU's and Yale's current initiatives are strongly tied to the arrival of new economic and political players on the international stage. Brazil, South Korea and India will surely be next for entrepreneurial American universities. But if the motivations for American universities universities to extend the liberal arts model abroad are not difficult to discern, 
What of the host countries? What is in it for them? The most obvious answer is the continued prestige of American higher education worldwide and the desire to provide that education at home so as to staunch the outflow of top talent to the US that has been a prominent feature of global student mobility for decades. Just last year, India had well over 100,000 students enrolled studying in, the United, in American universities and colleges. 100,000 Indian students more than in the US, while barely 3,000 students from the US returned to favor in India. The imbalance of talent flow between China and the US is even more dramatic. The wealthy Gulf states have burgeoning youth populations and insufficient universities to serve them. Female students flood the local schools and for the most part do not have the opportunities to study abroad that are available to their male peers. Like those Gulf countries, Singapore wants to attract talent. It has outstanding universities, but more capacity is needed. So even if host countries, like the ones I just cited, do not fully understand or even desire the American liberal arts campus, if that is what a prestigious American university has the capacity and desire to establish quickly and well, often with the promise of sending some of their own students to add flavor and letting research and graduate programs follow, governments can be enticed to support a liberal arts enterprise, and they've been doing it. For the American partners, and this is a very personal view, a fascinating process then ensues of mutual reconnaissance in education that may be as challenging, exhilarating, and mind-expounding a process as any liberal arts seminar you'll ever take. It's hard work, but it, it pays off. The spread of the liberal arts model abroad appears not to be coterminous with the capacity and appetite of American universities to offer their services, however. For a decade now, while almost no one was watching, countries in Europe and Asia have opened a significant number of homegrown liberal arts colleges where none existed before. The establishment of these new institutions without the involvement of American startup expertise is perhaps the strongest proof of concept of the resilience of the liberal arts. They are popping up in the UK, from whence the residential college once came to early America, in the Netherlands, Germany, China and South Korea, and the movement shows no sign of letting up. The features shared by these colleges reveal their origins in American liberal arts vision, but also their intent to adapt it. Most of these colleges are established as liberal arts entities within or associated with established universities, and they take the name University College or College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, thereby skirting the difficult American locution that includes the sciences in the liberal arts. People abroad find this completely baffling, and in fact, it's not playing so well in the United States these days either. I don't see any need for purity on this point. It's the concept that one wants to convey, not the title. These colleges occupy old convents or other buildings that are repurposed to, to feel intimate and residential like an old college. And they provide more housing and dining services than has been typical for their large parent universities. Student numbers are kept small in comparison to the university's total student body, ranging from 500 to 1,000 or so. And many classes are small seminars in contradistinction to the typical lecture of the European University or Asian University. The curricula are uncommonly broad for European or Asian undergraduate education, and the modularity and range of electives begin to approach American standards, though the topics are much more structured and less quirky than those of many lovable American colleges. Most significantly, the admissions process is much more selective and tailored than that of the parent universities and based on essays and interviews in addition to national exams. Even the SAT is sometimes required. The language of instruction is English and the target population is international. In Europe, these honors colleges are meant to stimulate the flow of student mobility through the <coughs> European Union that has been an explicit goal of the educational establishments of the member countries uh, ever since the so-called Bologna process there got underway. In the most radical departure of 
from a seemingly inviolable standard of American colleges, most of these colleges offer a bachelor's degree in three years. Can you imagine? This deviation, I think, is worth studying in the US, as time-conscious students have begun to think more flexibly about the enhanced menu of educational options that is available to them today. But why would these countries import the liberal arts model now, after all this time, just when these countries are as worried as Americans are about the connection between their university systems and the economy into which their graduates need to be placed? And just when meeting the scale of demand is a massive concern. In the US, a headline like this one from the English paper The Guardian about a new college in Belfast would be rare these days, and I'll quote it for you. Liberal arts offer something completely different. Liberal arts courses may be the next big thing as universities and employers seek broader skills. This is from The Guardian two years ago. It is an age-old argument. It, strike me as a, it strikes me as still a very good one, and it is confirmed by unattractive but necessary, necessary measures like earnings outcomes for college graduates. We know that college graduates continue to do better over time. That case is being ventilated and heard in the economically strongest pockets of old Europe and two of the most powerful economies of Asia at a time that it seems to be in decline here. The appeal for the Chinese government of establishing a few select liberal arts institutions even as it continues to build professional universities that can take in 10,000 students a year, is exemplified by the case of Chen Yongfang, a young man now 24 years old. A top student from Shanghai's Foreign Languages High School, Chen bucked the usual trajectory that would have taken him to an American research university to study engineering or medicine, instead choosing Bowdoin College where he double majored in psychology and economics. Chen was so enamored of his education that he wrote a best-selling book in China about the why and how of pursuing a liberal arts education abroad. When asked by Newsweek what he liked about it, he, said, he sounded like an admissions officer. He said, liberal arts is about fostering your identity. They want to cultivate your mind. You may not remember all the knowledge you've learned after four years, but they want you to know how to learn. And look at what he took. He took art, infant and child development, the history of sexuality, and the history of the US Civil War. He did independence of software piracy, good one for China, and on, Chi <laughs> and on China's Tang Dynasty Empress Wu Zetian. And he took an internship at Bowdoin's Child Care Center. He also studied Japanese politics. Chen's story encapsulates powerfully the potentials and pitfalls of the liberal arts in the complex interstices of our global networks. Clearly, Chen is the kind of leaderly talent you would want to keep in your country, and China is hoping to make that possible. Clearly, he's the kind of student you would, have, you would pay to have in your American classroom. Clearly, he could never have taken that course on the history of sexuality taught out of the queer and lesbian studies department anywhere in China. And just as clearly, it would be an eye-opening thing if an American student could study Japanese politics in China, ideally with Chen Yonfang in the classroom, and a real exchange of contested views could unfold. That scenario, however, seems a long way off. Change of such a fundamental ideological kind does not happen fast in China in any event, but under current economic conditions, China and other countries may find themselves compelled to contain global exchange and channel it more exclusively to the benefit of their own citizens. There is a more basic challenge for the liberal arts model in countries with government structures like China's. Liberal education was never just about training leadership cadres and teaching skills for getting around in an interconnected world although China, Singapore, and the UAE rightly recognize those benefits of the model. Liberal education since the 18th century has also been preparing Americans for citizenship in a participatory and fully representational democracy. That particular form of democracy is surely not the only viable model for a free society. I really believe that. 
But as the Dartmouth victory of 1818 showed, the Liberal Arts College owes some of its longevity and resilience to its vital contributions to that governance system, its participation. The liberal in liberal arts is ultimately about more than an open curriculum. It must be the assumption of American universities involved in launching liberal arts campuses in parts of the world that may seem inhospitable to its highest aims. It must be their assumption that engagement is better than isolation. And it must be their hope that over time, such campuses have a shot at being productive change agents for their host countries, as well as their own universities. The scale of liberal arts colleges will never allow them to meet a demand for higher education worldwide that will only keep growing. China graduated 1.5 million students per year 15 years ago. That number is now up to 5 million and counting every year. India's plans for tripling its university capacity, which lags far behind, will never be able to depend strongly on liberal education to fill it even though the country's democratic base is well set up for the model. America itself appears unlikely to be able to afford expansion of liberal education's reach, and the U.S. sector may go through further winnowing, as we've seen. Like the leaders of China and Europe who are going after liberal education today, we will have to accept that the Liberal Arts College has long been and will continue to be an elite niche in a positive sense, an elite niche within a matrix of education that is going to have to be much more capacious, layered and flexible than it is today. And it will indeed have to focus on teaching employable skill sets to the many at affordable cost. But elite need not mean elitist. And the greatest challenge of liberal arts colleges at home is ensuring that the gains of the last few decades in diversifying and expanding access are maintained and extended to the benefit of all who live in these institutions. The liberal arts campus is worth the effort of renewal because it offers a robust and nimble structure for learning, thinking, making and collaborating that has proved adaptable over time to new societal needs and contexts and magnetically attractive to students and faculty from all over the world. Our global age will continue to need the liberal arts model. If it can adapt once again, it will retain its relevance. And we all need a little romance, even if from time to time it hurts. I, I please push back. Ask questions, make comments. I would welcome your views very much. As is a Dickey Center rule, Dartmouth students are requested to ask their questions first. And if there are no students with questions, we'll turn to the rest of you. Yes, please. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. I'm just wondering if you can sort of shed some light on, um, I know that you were talking about how some universities, I mean, some liberal arts colleges have decided to um, make their rate of tuition increase slower, but why was it so fast? And like, why has it been so fast in recent years? This is an excellent question. I hope you could all hear it. it it's a question that is asked of every college president and university president. Why for so many years did um, the rate of tuition grow uh, ahead of inflation, basically, significantly ahead of inflation, sometimes double inflation and so forth? I think there are many little pieces to it, but the basic answer is that um, liberal arts education is highly dependent on, um, on extremely skilled labor that's taken a long time to uh, accomplish, you know, PhDs and so forth, as well as student support services that are highly uh, nuanced and refined, which means that salary costs, labor costs are high uh, per unit of what you deliver, which is the, the student education. And so that, that, that just means that compared to, say, um, a supermarket, you know, you're, you're, you're going to, your, your labor costs inflate much more rapidly. So, There's research associated with it and so forth. There are all sorts of things that you have to do to attract the kind of people who can deliver the education 
and, and that's just a higher cost than the, the average labor costs in society. So it's, most, it's mostly, it's mostly the, amount, the amount of money that we're paying for professor's salary? It's professors, it's not just professor salaries, uh, the, the question is to clarify the, the cost basis. It's not just professor salaries, but all the work that professors need to do to be at the top of their fields, the best teachers, the best researchers, which involves labs, which involves uh, publishing opportunities, which involves graduate stu student assistance and so forth. So it is that whole uh, panoply of intellectual investment that comes with the investment in, in, in the highest performing faculty that, that you end up paying for. Sorry, just one last question. Yeah. I guess I'm the only student here, so, but. Um, <laughs> well, is, I don't know. <laughs> is, but I, I'm still having a hard time trying to understand because is it that like the rate of all those things were increasing at a rate that was higher than inflation? I mean, like, I understand that those things are very costly, but why were they getting more costly so much quicker than the inflation rate? Well, there's, there's an average inflation rate that includes, of course, university inflation rates, but within total inflation, you can differentiate sectors. But here's the pushback that I would encourage universities to keep making, even as I think that the situation is politically toxic and they need to, we, we, need, we can't keep growing them at the rates that we've done. Um, when you look at other sectors that depend, like universities, on highly trained, highly skilled labor, intellectual labor, what are they? law, finance, um, medicine, same inflation rate. It is, it is only when you compare it sort of across the board, and so that includes the Teamsters, and it includes the auto manufacturers, and it includes everything, that those, those intellectual, those, those, those sectors that require high investment in intellectual labor, labor stand out. Yeah? So, so compared to the lawyers, we're, we're no more expensive. Less, probably. Um, I have a question about like the recruiting strategies of kind of say NYU, Abuja B, and these international liberal arts colleges. Um, from personal experience, it seems that they target feeder high schools in kind of foreign countries. So international top international schools, foreign language schools, or in Korea, certain boarding schools. And so I was wondering if this is kind of a strategy on their part, or is it like a limitation in terms of not being able to reach top talent in more local high schools or like traditional high schools? The question is about recruitment of students for campuses abroad. So now I, I will tell tales from the crypt of NYU Abu Dhabi, where I was provost and, and, and designed one of the strategies with, with a remarkable team. Here you come up against capacity issues. The question was, you know, do you only go after top feeder schools, many of which already have, of course, strong English language speaking students, or do you really go so fine grained and try to find every last student that you can find? Ideally, the latter, of course. Ideally, you, you try to be as broad and diverse as you possibly can, and we certainly try to think about that. But when your recruitment field is the world, 185 countries, um, and you're looking for initially 150 students, you have to think of how you're going to do that and how can you be smart about it. In principle, NYU Abu Dhabi, for example, as I'm sure is true of the Yale and US com campus, is open to all comers. Anyone can apply. How do you reach people is the question. And there, essentially what the universities do, and NYU Abu Dhabi uh, did this, uh, you, you, you follow the same mechanism that admissions offices in colleges in the US do, which is they work with preferred schools. They work with top schools to get top talent. And they assume that those top schools in New York City, in LA, wherever they are, have done a good job of diversifying their communities. And they have. So you, you try to find kids who, who are prepared to succeed, which essentially means that they have to have gone to probably to a pretty decent school. They don't have to go to a top school, but they have to have had opportunities. So yes, you do more or less pre-select by going to feeder schools, but you stay open to others. And I must say in the process, uh, what we did at Emory Abu Dhabi, we said, you know, we don't have the capacity to do this ourselves. We engaged the Institute of International Education, which is an extraordinary institution in New York that has for years sourced Fulbright students 
but does a lot of the kind of research, all the, a lot of the data that I gave you today come from the Institute of International Education. We worked with them and their offices, which are all over the world, to develop an outreach strategy to high school counselor, to college counselors, high school principals, including schools that they had never dealt with before. We created a whole new infrastructure to do that precisely to, to try to source students who might not come from already Americanized institutions. Um, how do you think this applies to what's going on now with the public education system in America? Um, as in, like, uh, you know, there's a whole talk about how, just like, what should happen. I don't know if you've seen the documentary Waiting for Superman. Um, just sort of what needs to be, like, the structure of the American education system. And you also mentioned at the end of your talk that it was going to be impossible for the majority of colleges to be liberal arts colleges. But what if you could apply the things that make that so great into, you know, the American education system, so it's sort of a basis for the entire country as it is, and then you can, when you get to the college level, specialize more. I don't really know what's being done about that, but I feel like it'd be really important. These are great questions. So first of all, I would say to you, they should put you on the committee to figure it out. Mm -hmm. But the question was, was, was about public education in America, and also uh, on the one hand, you know, um, and did you mean the, the high school system or the, the the entire, okay, public education is of great concern to us, so I'll say something about that. And the question went on to say, all right, even if you accept my point that liberal education is not a model, that the way it's on a Dartmouth, that can be extended to the, you know, the five million students a year who enter Chinese institutions or the hundreds of thousands that enter American institutions each year, isn't there something you can do to have a trickle effect uh, from the, the best practices of liberal arts education into broader institutions. Uh, the state of public education in this country, oh boy, um, it, it's dire. I mean, it is dire, it needs to be worked and it needs to be thought about. I happen to think that, our, that Arnie Duncan, the, the Secretary of Education, Martha Cantor, the Under Secretary for Higher Education, do the best they can in an absolutely difficult political and economic environment where also they don't have a whole lot of power. One of the problems, I hate to say it, about public education in America is that it isn't very public you know, in the sense that it is extremely local. You know, it's not nationally public. It is extremely localized. It operates at the state level if you're lucky and more likely it operates at these very local levels where it's just really hard to intervene or come up with any sort of grand uh, strategy that can be applied across the board. There's just massive resistance against that kind of uh, government interference. At the, we are very concerned at the Mellon Foundation about the state of some of the great state universities that have been built, including, of course, most prominently um, the University of California system, which one would have to say is probably the best public higher education system ever designed anywhere in the world. And it is just sad what has happened to it. It has truly completely eroded to such an extent that um, to be able to, 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 to maintain budgets at 10% what they were even 10 years ago, say, they have to now rely extremely heavily on out-of-state tuitions, which are now at a sticker price that is maybe $3,000 below Harvard or something like that. So that's no longer, if you ask me, a public ed education system, especially because financial aid those, those universities cannot offer it anywhere uh, near the rates that, that private institutions can. Uh, what is to be done there? I don't know. We have to keep plugging away at it and act in the, uh, and, and act in the public sphere. And I think, I always hope that private university presidents work with those of the public institutions to, f to make common cause. A magnificent institution like the University of Michigan, for example, you can't even think of it as a state institution anymore. It gets 7% of its annual budget from the state. It is essentially a, a, you know, a state-located institution <laughs> rather than a, than a state university. So there are a lot of issues there, and there are certainly massive issues with the flow through from high schools into universities. That connective tissue is really not there. I think that is one area where the undersecretary for higher education has been working very strongly with Arne Duncan, the secretary, to come up with solutions. But as dispersed as the system is, I see that, that as a great difficulty. 
Can you bring the benefits of liberal education into broader types of universities? Yes, I think that was Axtell's point, that that has in some ways happened when you look at um, the colleges that are the heart, at the hearts of research universities and indeed many of the public universities. They do operate in ways that are not quite as luxurious as what you would have here, but, and it, but they do produce the same sort of leadership cadres in many ways, and I think that needs to continue. I think that the initiative of a place like Middlebury to begin to share some of the wealth through online education is also important. I think we have, I haven't even barely touched the possibilities of online education, which I think have not begun to be mobilized, actually. So there are glimmers of hope, but it's a tough time. Yes? The idea of liberal arts education is not a, a stable idea. It's undergone historical shifts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and massive transformation. Uh, you began with a pastoral image, and you concluded with an image of uh, liberal arts education as a kind of business model uh, for the construction of American-style universities worldwide. The liberal arts uh, ideology emerged in order to produce a, a sense of the value of American uh, freedom mm -hmm. in a Cold War world. That world is over. Uh, instead of uh, sustaining a kind of pastoral romance with an understanding of the function of the liberal arts uh, that is an inheritance from the Cold War era, do you think that the uh, very self-definition of a liberal arts education should undergo uh, revaluation at this time? Instead of saying, let's keep this model as our utopian pastoral romance sitting together on a log, uh, what if um, academics begin to say, this is a moment to rethink what we mean by a liberal arts education? Precisely because the talk that you've delivered um, at the two ends produces what I hear is a massive self-contradiction. Uh, thank you very much. I'm not going to try to summarize that, especially because you spoke very clearly and loudly and eloquently. Um, I, I was hoping that that trajectory and contradiction would emerge, but I think that the contradiction um, is not one and the other in quite in the defined way that you articulated. It is not only the pastoral or the urban, you know, juggernaut version in the new economies, the tiger economies of Asia and the Middle East. I think that um, I was trying to show that the model indeed has adjusted over time because even what you describe as a Cold War defining moment, that's already a latter day stage in liberal arts education uh, that, that doesn't look a whole lot of what those early republic colleges were thinking about, Dartmouth at the time and then all those religiously funded colleges that, that ensued after the 1818 decision. So I completely subscribe to your view that liberal arts education is not stable, that it has been rethought over time, and that it needs rethinking now. I think we need to take it on. We can't sit back and let it erode. Yep. I'm not sure I entirely agree with it. I mean, look, I think about Mr. Dickey's statement in his 1956 convocation address where he defined liberal arts education as our best bet for liberating men from the meanness and meagerness of mere existence, besides the wonderful end alliteration. Um, I mean, it seems that's just as enduring today. Yeah, at least it sounds to me that's the romantic side of what you were talking about. But it still seems a very appealing idea that it shouldn't be enough to simply have mere existence and that this is a chance for people to, to, to learn and to, to grow into having a much broader base, even though it may not be possible for everybody to enjoy this. It's still an important part of the human existence that there's some part of the population, at least, is able to expand beyond the meanness and meagerness of mere existence. Well, I completely agree with that. I think romance is important, as I said. And when I thought about, and, and so, so we can't just say it isn't just about leadership. It is, it is also about democratic and civic values. I think that's absolutely true. And having some cohort of society in this sort of cadre role, but you would have to admit it is going to be a small cadre. It won't be for everyone. And you have to be somewhat comfortable with that. You have to accept that if you accept the, what, what you just said. Uh, I do believe in it. I do believe that 
to the extent that that can be extended in the way that my young friend here suggested, that's also a good thing. If, if those of our arts graduates go on to teach, if they go on to write, if they go on uh, to be present in the blogosphere, in the public sphere in different ways, I think that there is a certain <coughs> continuing value uh, in that romance. Uh, I, when I thought about what I would talk about today, I was incredibly tempted, but I thought it was it would just be too solipsistic, so I didn't do it. To, just to describe to you the experience of teaching in Abu Dhabi, which I've now done twice. We have a winter term there, so I moonlight in January and go to Abu Dhabi, where it's always nice weather in January. Um, and I teach a course that absolutely proves your point to students, most of whom would never have dreamt of going to the Arts College here or elsewhere, even if they're American students. Um, I teach a co course that is completely comparative called Gardens of Eden um, that I could only have even conceptualized there, I think. So it was for myself a thrill. And the course asks the question, what does the story of the Garden of Eden and the physical garden in a desert, what does that mean in the Judaic, the Christian, and the Muslim traditions? And I teach that there because, of course, in a desert environment, you come, become quickly aware that this is what a gift the Garden in Eden must have been, much more so than you would think about here. And the reason I can teach as well there is that the kids come from those three traditions. Those kids, I mean, who are not the Buddhists from Brunei and in Indonesia, who are also in the course. And so you get absolutely that, that wonderful exchange of ideas that really is an an exchange of pure ideas that may have no practical application whatsoever. And I do think that all of us, uh, one, once we write our final reflections on the course, after we've gone to see the garden tomb complexes, the Muslim garden tomb complexes of India, the reflections we write at that moment, I wish I could read them to you because they, are, they, they prove your point that this continues to be, I think, a very valuable exercise. It is a luxury at the same time, but it is a necessary luxury. Yes. It's me again. Um, so, <laughs> you had very good questions before. Keep going. Um, I understand and definitely feel like, especially at Dartmouth, a liberal arts education does provide you with so many different opportunities and just really like the best mind in the different disciplines and all of these sort of things that you've described that liberal arts education brings. But I'm just wondering what you think about. An education, uh, about this, an education is, it cut, it's two ways. It's what can the institution provide, but like how much is the student going to take up among that? So I guess my, my question, but it's maybe more a comment is, I think the liberal arts institution does a great job of saying this is what we're all about, but I don't know if the students are going to the same places, like understanding that's why, that's what they could be getting. Does that sort of make I, sense? I, I, I think, the, the, I hear your question, uh, but you should say, if I'm not getting it right, as saying, all these wonderful things are being provided. The admissions brochure is true. You have to go after it, but it's all provided. But it may not be that students as a collective or individually make all of it that they can or bring out all of it, even though they come with great talents and appetite. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Like, <laughs> when people are applying for colleges and they're applying just to like colleges they think are good colleges, different research institutions, liberal arts institutions, they just want to get a good education. <laughs> right. And then, you know, and then they get to Kool-Aid and they come to school. And <laughs> this happened to me. I, I kind of knew I wanted the liberal arts education, but, but as I said, you know, all those wonderful shibboleths that this is what liberal arts education does and this and that, it's only with hindsight that I saw that. I really came because I knew I could do a bunch of different things and I knew it was a really good school and it was exciting to go to America. I, I agree. I, I was not aware when I was doing it that I was getting all these, uh, developing all these skill sets, and not just skill sets, but really aptitudes and attitudes. You know, the liberal arts is in some ways an attitude and a stance towards the world and the people that we make our worlds with. And I think that it's okay not to be aware of that okay. all the time, you know. Like, it can become a little too preachy, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm a sophomore here, and I feel like 
there are definitely some people that I know who would have been sort of expanding their mind at the same rate as had they gone to a place where there is just like a huge lecture hall all the time because I think that I think that it might I don't know what is your opinion of it being and it making people have this experience even when they're totally unaware of it happening. <laughs> like I believe I believe in uh, <laughs> I'm like GE, you know, bring good things to life. I think, it's, I think it's a good thing to provide a place like Dartmouth, a place like Williams, a place like NYU, a place like Harvard, a place like Stanford, a place like Berkeley or Michigan. The students are already pre-selected to a great degree, and so you almost can't go wrong with them. That's still, but there is a great uh, responsibility in, in, in making ideas, perspectives, and opportunities available to them. So I, I think it's what you describe is not untrue, but I would hope that our Dartmouth continues to do a really good job picking smart students like you yeah, to take advantage of it. Yes, lady here and then. I'm fascinated by the idea of the American University in Abu Dhabi, and I wonder how much restriction is put upon its uh, birth and development by the local government. As I asked, we spent four years in Kuwait and our daughters, we had one more year to go in high school, wanted to get a, a course in calculus, which they couldn't get from the American school. I went over to the Kuwait University and inquired. And the professor said they, he would be pleased to teach them but he would have to ask the permission of his class because there had never been a woman in the class before and there could not be if any of the other students objected. Uh, now, putting a liberal arts institution into that kind of environment, it boggles my mind. Well, it boggled my, the question is, were any restrictions put on NYU Abu Dhabi when we began to develop uh, the campus there, a liberal arts campus in a, in a predominantly Muslim society, certainly a forward-looking Muslim society, but a Muslim society and a conservative Bedouin one uh, at that. And the answer is that uh, we have a full partnership there between the government of Abu Dhabi and, the, um, and NYU. And one of the foundational agreements for us, and it was a walkaway issue for us, was that we would establish a co-educational campus that would be open to local students, but students from all over the world. Everything would be co-educational, and that we would conduct our affairs on that campus, that is to say, our teaching, our social life, and so forth, in keeping with the same standards that prevail at NYU. And so far, we've been going for two years now, we, I have not been disappointed teaching the Garden of Eden, again, the first parents were naked. I mean, you, I'm an art historian. You can basically not teach it without showing pictures of naked people. And it, it has not been a, an issue. So I thought that was an interesting litmus test. Another example where the liberal arts really can be powerfully liberating in a sense is that our president there, and John Saxon, has for several years now taught a course particularly to Emirati students, to local students, on the way the Supreme Court over time has adjudicated in America conflicts between church and state. Now this is a fascinating thing to teach in a country where you have not the same hard and fast distinctions between religion, religious governance and, and, and political governance, even though there are uh, distinctions there too. So the, these things have uh, proved possible, but the only way we could do it was by going there, living there, listening. It was a truly interactive process of mutual learning. And we, you know, we check in with each other. You know, it, 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 it has to be collaborative. And, and you also have to push back from time to time. And so that's, but you can only do that if you spend the time, as you know. And it's a lot of cups of coffee and pomegranate juice. And you know. Yes, you, and then you're trying to keep track of everyone. Yes, please. I wanted to mention something very practical. Uh, there's a resident of the Upper Valley here who at one time was the chief financial officer at Dartmouth. And then some years later, after spending some time on Wall Street, he was the chief financial officer at Brown. And he, it was 15 or 20 years ago, 
and he is very dedicated and has been ever since those experiences to the notion that higher education does not need to cost as much money as it does. And there's a foundation that he's been active in called Illumina Foundation. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's an extraordinary organization. But at any rate, yeah. it was fascinating yeah. to me that he, from his first-hand experience, felt that long ago that the costs were escalating beyond what they needed to be. They've become quite rarefied. Here's a, I'm very interested, I'd like to know the name of this gentleman who's been saying for a long time that these costs don't need to escalate as fast as they do. And it is true that student life has become a little bit too handholderish from my point of view. I mean, it's like almost everything's provided. I thought I was too, too watched over at Williams, so I think it's different even now today. Yes. Um, <coughs> My husband is this one here. He sits on the board of trustees at the American Farm School in Thessaloniki, Greece. Uh -huh. I am the official historian of that school, founded by American missionaries. When we first uh, came into contact with the school and lived in Thessaloniki, that was what forty years ago or so. You would never see in what you would call a liberalization. Right. The trend was not there. Right. Although the president was American and the board of trustees was mixed with Greek and American, you would see no liberalization. With the problems that came up with Kosovo um, in, uh, and Serbia a couple of years ago, not a couple, maybe 10, 15 years ago when they first emerged, at that same time we added a graduate school. We then accepted at our school in Thessaloniki students from Kosovo, Serbia, who were slitting each other's throats back in their own country, taken into the American Farm School, which is regulated by the Greek government in a, in a uh, stranglehold, practically. Uh, these students suddenly became friends. Mm -hmm. Now, the tendency is for the Greek government to see Oh, look what they're doing at the American Farm School. They are improving international relations among these Balkan peoples. With it, at the same time, when the uh, university component was founded, along with the high school component, they began to liberalize the curriculum. We now have one or two Dartmouth graduates who go over there, what, every year, and live with the students in order that the students learn English and then uh, teaching the students what American schools are like over here in this country so that many of those students are now accepted in the United States and the flow is coming the other way. We're suddenly getting American students over at the American <laughs> Farm School taking courses over there. What has the Greek government got to do? They see this pressure, and where they had a stranglehold on us, maybe 10, 15 years ago, they're releasing the stranglehold. And what you see now at the American Farm School is the liberalization of the curriculum. It's not, as you were describing, where I went to school or you went or somebody else, a liberal education. But it is in the process of liberalizing. This process under the most one of the most restrictive departments of education in Europe. That's an inspiring story. The worst kingdom. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank everyone for coming, and please join me in thanking everyone. Thank you.